Well, I've got a built-in excuse if I go long today. I went to change the time on the clock, and the clock decided it was time to quit. So it, it's not up there. It's, it, it was that kind of clock that was only going to be right twice a day anyway. So we got rid of it. Well, we've spoken about the nature of time not too long ago. There's two basic ways of thinking about time as cyclical, as something that things come and they go around and around again, or maybe to think of it as linear, that it's a progressive line that's going somewhere. And frankly, uh, that's the Christian view, is that life is going someplace. God's in charge. He's working and he's accomplishing his ends, both in time and outside of it. But humanity does work in cycles. In fact, a lot of times we think we're making progress when we're just going around and around and around. It's been said that those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. And that's got a little bit of both in it. If you forget what's gone before, if you think the situation you're in is unique to humanity, you're going to keep doing the same dumb things and getting the same terrible results. But there is something that's better. There's a recognition and an encouragement to take a different view, a long view, that's determined to remain steadfast and not repeat the failures of the past. When we last came together a couple of Sundays ago, we saw in the book of Exodus, as we're studying the Old Testament names of God, how God introduced himself to the people of Israel, and he did it all in a matter of less than three months, out in the Sinai wilderness. He had miraculously delivered them from slavery in Egypt. He'd begun to lead them across that land that stood between there and their promised land, what we know as Israel. And between the Red Sea and Mount Sinai, where he would establish his covenant with Israel, he revealed himself in various ways according to their needs. He revealed himself as Yahweh Rapha, the I Am, who would heal them as they went through their struggles, went through their journey. He revealed himself to them as Yahweh Jireh, the God who would provide for them. He would provide six mornings a week for 40 years. That stuff they called, what is it? Manna. Out on the ground for them to pick up. And then he also revealed himself as Yahweh Nisi, the banner under which they could achieve victory over any enemy. Just boom, boom, boom. God is revealing these things to them. And then when they come to Mount Sinai, he reveals himself further to Moses and to them when he tells them in the Ten Commandments that they are to have no other gods before him, beside him, in addition to him. He says, because I am Kana, I am jealous. And I shared with you that that is the the picture of of, of a marriage relationship, of being exclusively committed one to another. God was saying, I will be your husband. I will be your God. You are to be my people. You are to be my spouse. Sadly, if you know the story of the Exodus, you'll know that even while Moses was up on Mount Sinai and receiving the law by which the people were to walk, What were they doing down below? They were making a golden calf, weren't they? He's been up there way too long. Old Moses must have died up there. And so his own brother Aaron led in the forming of the golden calf and saying, this is the God that led you out of Egypt. And so this sad pattern was revealed. A a, a people that would, on one hand, make exclusive promises to God... And then on the other, they would forget them. They would turn against him. God had told them what he was going to do when they did that. There was going to be discipline. There was going to be correction. 
And at some point in this cycle, they would come to realize, oh, maybe it is our fault. And they would repent and return to him. And then things would be restored. Wash, rinse, repeat. Over and over and over again. You can read it as they go across the wilderness. In fact, they were stuck in the wilderness for 40 years because of some of that disobedience. You find it in the time after Moses had passed from the scene and Joshua took the reins. And then after Joshua passed on to his reward, we enter the time that the Bible calls the time of the judges. And in those days of the judges, we are moving about 200 years this morning. We're jumping ahead about 200 years. And we're going to be looking in the book of Judges, chapter 6. Because here we find, and it's not the first time in the book of Judges, another sad round of this circular way of relating to God, making a commitment, turning away, going through discipline, coming back. And so it comes back around one more time, this sad, disturbing pattern. And we read about it beginning in Judges 6.1. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. What does it mean to say here that Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord? Well, the pattern we can discern, to put it in a way perhaps that we can easily remember, is that they failed to walk the line. They failed to walk the line of commitment of faith in God. They failed to walk the line of obedience to the commands he had given them. And they began to worship the idols, the false gods of the peoples around them. You know, how, how could such a pattern repeat itself so many times for the Israelites or for anyone else don't people learn over time? Well, the answer is that the sons and daughters and the grandsons and the granddaughters failed to learn the lessons of grandma and grandpa's generation. Back in chapter 5, verse 31, we read that after the last, the previous cycle of rebellion and discipline and repentance, there had been 40 years of peace. In other words, about enough time for two generations to be born and to grow up. Grandma and Grandpa knew how bad it had been. But Mom and Dad, well, it seemed all right, and they did it because they'd been taught to. And by the time you got the grandkids, well, they just didn't worry about it at all. Kids, your parents and grandparents might seem a little odd. They might seem a little out of step with the culture, especially with all of their faith talk. 
But listen, don't be sucked in. Don't seek what's popular or exciting or worldly at the cost of abandoning what's true. That's the temptation of every generation. To walk the line of faith, even though the culture is circling away. And so kids, I urge you, be faithful. Be faithful. Listen. Learn something from these gray hairs around you who've walked and maybe they've made their own detours and they've had to go through their own uh, valleys and their own wilderness experiences and they've come back around and they, maybe they don't want to give you all the gory details but their heart is for you and when they advise you don't go that way they have the best intentions in mind don't be like Gideon's generation who didn't listen to God it finally got bad enough they cried out to God just like they always did God sent him a prophet. And then he reached out and chose an unlikely champion. We read his story beginning in verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak at, in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have, and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. When the angel appeared to Gideon, Gideon was hiding, hiding from the Midianites. He was threshing grain, something that would normally be done up on a high level place where the wind could blow through and, and blow the chaff away, but he doesn't want to attract any attention. And so he's down in a wine press, carved in the rock, and there he's beating out the grain and having to separate the chaff by hand. It's a tedious process, but he wants to have food for himself and for his family and there the angel greets him with these surprising words. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. <laughs> That's a who me kind of moment, isn't it? Who me? Don't miss Gideon's response to what the angel said. To hear him tell it, from his standpoint, God has abandoned them. That's the way it reads here. God's gone silent. He isn't doing the things he used to do. He's left his people alone. You see, Gideon's gotten sucked in the way we always get sucked in. We want God's benefits without his obligations. God had done exactly what he promised would happen to a people who turned aside from him. He hadn't broken any promises. He'd let them experience life without his protection, life without his provision, life without his blessing. It's always the same story, even today. We learn enough to call on God through Jesus as our Savior, but we don't want to walk with God. We don't want to walk by faith. That's asking too much. We say that's old, it's out of style. And God lets us experience what life on our own is like. Sometimes in spades. And then we have the gall to blame him for not taking care of us. But here in our passage, it's gotten to the point 
God's ready to turn the page, to turn the tide. And so God's angel gives Gideon an unexpected commission there in verse 14. Let me read it again. Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Well, Gideon responds with all the reasons why he's the wrong man for the job. But God answers with the only answer anyone should ever need to hear. I will be with you. It doesn't matter who you are, what your education, what your training, what others say about you. If God calls you, that's all that matters. That seems to settle Gideon down, and, and he asks one thing in verse 18. He says, please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. And what happens next? It blows Gideon's mind. Look at verse 19. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace. Do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. There's a fearful reaction to what happened. Even today, with all the incredible movie effects that we've probably grown so accustomed to, it's nothing for us to see it on the screen. Let it happen in person, though, huh? This angel just, just touches the end of his staff to the rock. And then he's gone. It's stunning, isn't it? Wouldn't you just be filled with wonder? And, and no wonder... Uh, Gideon cries out with fear, Ah, Adonai Yahweh, sovereign Lord, I've seen the angel of Yahweh face to face. And he knows what the penalty is. He's going to just be burned up. Eyeballs first. But notice that although the angel was God, the Lord still spoke. Peace. Do not be afraid. You are not going to die. God's merciful response to his fearful reaction. And out of that moment of fear, followed by comfort, it says that Gideon built an altar. It wasn't an altar uh, to offer a sacrifice on. He would build one of those in just a few verses. But this is an altar of remembrance. And he named it one of the names that's on our banners. They've moved to the back as we've entered uh, our Thanksgiving season, but you will find back there on that side, the top left has the word shalom, Yahweh shalom, Yahweh shalom, the I am, the Lord is peace. Now, ironically, what happened next was anything but peaceful. In fact, God's instruction started mighty close to home. He told Gideon, go cut down under the cover of darkness. Go, go cut down your dad's idols. Go slaughter the oxen. Build an altar. Offer me a sacrifice instead. No, there's, there's no peace there. Not the, not the kind we used to think, usually think of. And we're not at all going to take time to go into the whole story of Gideon and the 300 men and how they routed the Midianite army. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. It's miraculous from first to last. 
the thing I want you to see is that as long as Gideon lived, this man who had had this experience with God, Israel experienced peace. The peace that God had always intended for them to know. But sadly, as Judges 8, beginning in verse 33, tells us, that all changed when he died. It says that no sooner had Gideon died than the Israelites again prostituted themselves to the Baals. That's the false gods of the people around them. They set up Baal Bereth as their God and did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. They also failed to show any loyalty to the family of Jerob Baal, that is Gideon, in spite of all the good things he had done for them. My goodness, as soon as his life was over, they could no longer walk the line. They fell back into those old circular habits. Yahweh Shalom. Did you know that Gideon's altar here, that's the only time that that name for God is used in the entire Bible? The only time. And yet that idea of shalom, of a completeness, a wholeness, a peace, a rest that comes from God... Uh, it, it's found throughout the pages of the Bible. I, I want to consider just a few of them with you this morning before we close. Consider, for instance, Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4. You will keep in perfect peace those whose mind is steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord Yahweh himself is the rock eternal. God will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are set on him. Then when prophecies of Jesus, of both his birth and his sacrificial death, are spoken, they are both tied to God-given peace. First of all, consider Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of what? Peace. Of the, government, uh, of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That's prophesying his birth. And then there's that glorious passage in Isaiah 53 that prophesies his death and what it will accomplish for us. Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 4. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Peace he gives us through his suffering. As Jesus himself made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem the last Sunday before he was crucified, Luke tells us that he stopped as he came over that hillside where you can look across the valley and you can see the city of Jerusalem. And he wept there. And he said in Luke 19, 42, If you, even you, had only known on this day what could bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. What the nation as a whole rejected, Jesus promised to his disciples. As he spent that last evening with them, he sought to prepare them for the unimaginable things they were about to go through 
along with him. And then he says in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have what? Peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. God's desire is for each of us to have peace, to walk in peace every moment of every day. Not the way the world defines peace, the absence of external difficulties, but the presence of an internal wholeness, contentment, satisfaction. Paul's familiar words in Philippians chapter 4 point the way. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the what? Peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice And the God of what? Peace will be with you. God's peace becomes ours as we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. God's peace remains ours. It fills us as we walk the line of faith. Even though the world is going in circles around us. Just keep on being steadfast. The world's ideas ebb and flow and change. Let's be consistent. I love the words of a song that's written by the rock singer Van Morrison. You might not know it, but he's a peculiar sort of guy, but he's also a Christian. And for all he has sung about all other sorts of things, he penned these lyrics that always hit me every time I hear them. When will I ever learn to live in God? To live in God. He gives me everything I need and more. When will I ever learn? When will I ever learn to live in God? God is peace. To know Him, to follow Him, is to know peace. To live in him, to do his will, it's to know what Jesus left us as his legacy. And this is from John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You know, another thing about time, they say, is the more things change, the more they remain the same. Going in circles. Going in circles. What comes around goes around. Times when people seem to be closer to God, culture seems to be closer to God, then it's getting bored with it and it's getting away from it. And, and uh, th- there are those that are drawn to that and there are those that think the sky is falling. And neither perspective is correct. God's on his throne. He's just waiting around for those who are wandering away to realize what a mess they've made to turn their hearts and come back to him. Yeah, it might be the way grandma and grandpa did it. But you know, there's a lot of wisdom in just walking the line. 